Well, welcome. Uh, we have Dr. Barrett. We have uh, members from the wider seminary community and beyond our students. We have members from the wider community here today. And especially, this is for uh, a lecture that we wanted to not only uh, have you give, but have it taped so that we could be part of an archive of materials for our students who are in the student debt program and uh, talk to them about the importance of money, which is something we don't always do uh, in our churches, yet alone in our seminary <coughs> classes. So uh, I think most of you are familiar with Dr. Lee Barrett. Uh, I don't think I can say, I don't think I could possibly say enough about this faculty at Lancaster Theological Seminary. Lee could be, as, and, and I'll just put it on you, all of our faculty could be at any prestigious institution in the United States teaching in their particular field. Me. And, but instead, we're at a dump like this. <laughs> <laughs> instead, you're at a, at a small school where you interact with uh, students on a uh, personal basis. I'm a, I'm a graduate of that prestigious school where the professors did their best, but probably by the end of the, of the semester, they couldn't possibly know all the students that they had because there were just too many of them. At Lancaster Theological Seminary, uh, students are known by their uh, by their academic work and but in their lives. And uh, Lee has been here the longest now. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, and it is kind of a resource, I think, to new faculty as they come and to students as they come to set their uh, where they are in the context of uh, their journey and their lives. And I've been privileged to sit in on courses with Lee and have the opportunity to uh, experience the excellence of his teaching as well as other faculty members. He's, he's the professor of uh, systematic theology here mm -hmm. and um, is a uh, known uh, to the students as an excellent teacher, known to his colleagues as an excellent scholar, and known to the community. That You may not know that, but He's in much in demand as a teacher in churches throughout Lancaster County uh, and beyond. Actually, you go, you go further than just Lancaster County. But the church I served for 16 years, uh, uh, Lee Barrett was, so we always got his dates on the calendar first so that we could plan around him, you know, just so that we could be sure to have him on an annual basis. So uh, he's here to talk to you about his uh, experience with money, but also a man that uh, has touched many lives, uh, and a good friend of his, Dr. Henry Nellon. So welcome, Lee. We're glad that you're here. Well, thank you. And th thank you for that introduction. You're welcome. <laughs> and as Randy said, we're going to be talking about money. I want to reflect with you on a topic that may sound paradoxical or even bizarre, the spirituality of fundraising. The talk could be subtitled, How to Ask People for Money as a Form of Prayer. Many of us think of fundraising, both the asking and the giving, as an unsavory, maybe even dirty business. And I must confess I fall in that category. I still shudder to recall the trepidation that I felt in the eighth grade when my music teacher <coughs> announced that we band members would need to solicit donations from friends and relatives to pay for new musical instruments. If I did not make phone calls and pay house visits, he explained, I would be cursed forever with the same bass clarinet whose bottom keys stuck so badly that anything below low C would be eternally beyond my reach. So I remember how my knees quaked as I rang a neighbor's doorbell. Fearing that the door would be slammed in my face or that diabolical jeering would greet my request. Asking people for money still seems to many of us to be an exceedingly icky activity. 
tragically required by the sad reality that the institutional bills must be paid. When we ask someone for financial assistance, we can feel demeaned, as if it's a form of begging. Or we can feel like we are being a nuisance and that folks will wince inside when they see us approach with hands outstretched. We are on the other end of the transaction when we are asked for a contribution, we can feel exploited, used. The suspicion inevitably arises that we are, that we are, people are just being nice to us in order to get their greedy little hands in our pockets. So it was with utter shock that I read the very profound spiritual author Henri Nouwen's claim that fundraising is a very rich and beautiful activity. It is a confident, joyful, and hope-filled expression of ministry. That's a quote. Come on, Henry. Are you serious? Beautiful? Joyful? A stewardship campaign? In the same extravagant vein, he continued, fundraising is first and foremost a form of ministry. It is as spiritual as giving a sermon, entering a time of prayer, visiting the sick, or feeding the hungry. Notice that it's as spiritual as those activities. This is doubly unbelievable to me, coming from a man who was so otherworldly, so obviously more at home in a prayer chapel than in a bank office, that he seemed almost oblivious to the power or even the existence of money. Now, many of you may be familiar with Nouwen's voluminous writings on spirituality. Some of you may have been deeply moved by them. Some of you may even have heard the enormously popular lecturer speak. So let me say a little word about his life. Henry was born in, <coughs> excuse me, 1932 in the Netherlands, where he became a Roman Catholic priest. He moved to the United States in 1964, studied psychology and psychiatry, became a protege of the celebrated therapist Carl Menninger, drank deeply from the well of Carl Rogers, the father of client-centered therapy. If you've ever used the phrase, I, I hear what you're saying, you are a disciple of Carl Rogers. <coughs> and he eventually taught pastoral care and counseling at Notre Dame, Yale, and Harvard. All the while that he was imbibing psychological lore, he was also immersing himself in the daunting spiritual writings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers of the fourth and fifth centuries. He was endearing, eccentric, and a strangely magnetic personality whose classes attracted multitudes. Some of his explanations for his actions made sense to no one but himself. For example, he announced that he was leaving Yale because he was tired of the institution's chronic and inveterate elitism, and he was going to take a position at Harvard instead. <laughs> Somehow, that made sense to Henry. And when he wasn't teaching, he was itinerating throughout the country, giving public lectures, leading retreats, and retreating himself to silent monastic communities. By the way, he persuaded the administration at Yale that he needed every other semester off in order to recharge his spiritual batteries. He was indeed an intense introvert. And his unusual request was granted. I've tried that argument with the administration at LTS with somewhat less success. <laughs> he lived the last years of his life in L'Arche, a community for people with developmental disabilities near Toronto whom he said were more insightful than the average divinity student. Before his death in 1996, he wrote over 40 books on the spiritual life, best-selling books that had an impact on the lives of millions. He lived austerely, gave away his royalties and most of his salary to various charities, and usually had no idea how much money he had in the bank. His checks often bounced, and his income tax form was an inscrutable mystery to him. And when ATM machines appeared, he seemed to think that they dispensed free money. 
So my surprise was enormous when I discovered that he had written a reflection about money and how to obtain it. It was like being told that Donald Trump had written a book about servant ministry <laughs> or that Mike Tyson had studied Kierkegaard. Actually, Mike Tyson has studied Kierkegaard and turns up at Kierkegaard conferences where he advances his interpretations with a certain passion and forcefulness. I always defer to his opinions. <laughs> now, now his reflections on spirituality of fundraising and philanthropy were personally astonishing to me because I'd gotten to know Henri in the late 1970s. I'm not name dropping or trying to impress anyone, for Henry was instantly the best friend of everyone he met. Claiming him as an acquaintance is no distinction whatsoever for he was indiscriminately relational. He was absolutely convinced that any form of ministry requires reciprocity and mutuality and asserted that we all minister to one another. So, in his own educational ministry, he insisted on living in the dorms with the students and fully sharing their lives. This, I'm sure, was very taxing and draining for an introvert. So he lived a couple of dormitory do doors down from me in a humble, spartan room. Often on a Saturday morning, I would trudge towards our communal bathroom, meet another student coming out of it who would warn, don't go in there. Henry's at the sink, radiating holiness. You just won't be able to take it before your morning coffee. <laughs> and there was truth in the warning. Henry did exude a compassion that was almost intimidating. In the popular imagination, such palpable sanctity is usually not associated with financial themes. Now, forgive my reminiscences. I hope they convey a sense of the incongruity of the conjunction of the concepts Henry Nouwen and fundraising. But it is that very incongruity, that improbability, that gives his reflections on money such authority and power. Nowen wanted to understand the question, why do many of us have such a negative response to the prospect of money and fundraising? Nowen, with typical candor, goes right for the heart of the matter, right for the root cause. He concluded, we shy away from asking people for money because we're scared. We're afraid. The theme of fear was at the heart of Henry's diagnosis of almost all human maladies. It was his version of the doctrine of original sin. We sin because we're afraid. In this instance, what is it that we're afraid of? Well, according to Nowen, lots of things. We're afraid of appearing to be vulnerable. If we ask for money, we are broadcasting the fact in public that we have a weakness, a deficiency of some sort. We need more money. We have not succeeded in being autonomous, self-sufficient, and we make it clear that we do stand in need of others. And that's not the American way. You should be the captain of your own ship. You should pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And to admit that we need something is throwing ourselves on the mercy of others. And that public admission of dependence is very, very scary. And another thing, that's not bad enough. We're also afraid of being resented. We fear that the potential donor will feel about us the way we feel when we see Jehovah's Witnesses approaching our door. We suspect that the donors are really saying to themselves, here comes that Barrett guy again, asking for another handout. I better give it to him so he'll go away and stop pestering me. Or even worse, we're afraid of being rejected. What if the potential donor says, no, I really do not value your enterprise, your project, your institution, why don't you just go away? No. 
Why do we fear all these things? Why are we so compulsively fearful? For now on, our fear is the child of our inveterate, acute neediness. We need to feel secure. And we have an allergic reaction to admit in our insecurity and our dependence. We need respect from our fear, peers, and we cringe at the prospect of manifesting weaknesses. And we need affirmation, and we balk at the display of our deficits. We need affection, and so we quake at the possibility that we may be an annoyance to someone. In short, we fear that all our limitations, our finitude, will be held up for public inspection and assessment, and we will be found to be wanting. We fear the verdict of the world, saying, in our eyes, your beloved projects, your beloved goals, your beloved school, your beloved congregation have no worth. And therefore, you have no worth. So, according to Nowen, what should we do about our insistent need for affirmation, acceptance, and affection? Those things that cripple our efforts to solicit the funds that our projects need. Are we trapped forever by the fact that we are insatiable little love sponges, craving desperately to be valued? Now one has a solution to the problem. And at first, it might seem stark and harsh. It's simply this. Get over your neediness. Get over yourself. But how can we possibly do that? Can you just get up one morning, turn on the alarm clock and say, yeah, I'm just tick, sick and tired of being so needy, so I think I'll stop. From now on, I vow that I will stop needing other people's positive opinion of me. From now on, beginning this very moment, I will be a paragon of self-contentment and self-assurance. No more craving affirmation from others for me. I don't need that stuff anymore. I got over that. I'm all better now. All I need is my own self-approval. For now, that project is crazy and delusional. Nowen was trained in psychiatry, and he was a, tr a Christian steeped in the traditions of prayer. And both of those legacies taught him that life doesn't work like that. The autonomous, self-legislating self is a delusional myth. We don't create our characters from nothing. We don't select the type of person that we shall be from a catalog. We don't pick our basic needs, desires, and wants. How many people here prefer chocolate to vanilla? Okay. Is there a time in your life when you said to yourself, I could go chocolate or I could go to vanilla? I choose from now on to be the kind of person who prefers chocolate. Does anybody remember doing that? So you gave yourself a fondness for chocolate by a self-legislating act, an act of will that has been governing your life ever since? So now, as a Christian and as a psychiatrist, knew that we do not create ourselves. We cannot perform such a heroic, superhuman feat of resolution as saying, I'm not going to be self-centered anymore. We cannot grit our teeth, hunker down, flex our spiritual muscles, and eliminate our neediness by an act of will. Now I knew full well that the amount of control that our egos can exercise over our basic personality structure is very, very minimal. We are emphatically not the captains of our own ships. So far, this sounds like pretty pretty dismal stuff. You're needy, 
You want affection, you want it compulsively, you want it obsessively, you want affirmation from everybody, and there's nothing you can do about it. Have a nice day. <laughs> but there's more. Nowen was a theologian of grace. He knew that we cannot heal ourselves, and he knew that from personal experience, for he was subject to bouts of debilitating depression over which he knew he could exercise no control. According to Nowen, if we are to be healed, the healing must come from beyond our meager, pathetic, volitional resources. We need help, we need grace, or else we are in big, big trouble. And therefore, for now, and it's only the recognition that we are already loved by God that can heal us. That, for him, is the essence of the Christian good news. In Jesus Christ, God has embraced us so thoroughly that we don't need any other sources of affection or, affirma or affirmation. The problem with us people is we've been looking for love in all the wrong places. We have expected other people to fill the boundless vacuum, the bottomless emptiness in our hearts. And they cannot do that because our need for love is infinite and other people are only finite. No being on earth, not your spouse, not your partner, not your children, not your parents, not your friends, not even your golden retriever can give you all the love that you need. To think that any human individual or institution could satisfy our restless hearts is, according to Nowen, a recipe for becoming bitter and resentful. For we will always feel disappointed and let down. When Nowen did premarital counseling, he would always probe the couple, asking each, each one if they expected that the other would make them perfectly happy. And if they said yes, he would caution them that they were not ready for marriage. In fact, he wouldn't just caution them, he would refuse to marry them and refuse to continue with the counseling. Now one was certain that the infinite expectation, the infinite burden that we lay on one another breeds the anger that we feel when the anticipated absolute happiness is not forthcoming. And the disappointment fuels the resentment that we feel when we recognize how dependent on the other we really are. And that makes us mad to realize that we really need the affirmation and affection of another person and they might not give it. That embitters folk. So that misplaced expectation of ultimate fulfillment from another finite creature for now and is responsible for the tragic escalation of domestic violence that we see every night on the local news. And sadly, it's the same scenario with our fundraising efforts. If our fundraising is driven by neediness, if we expect affirmation and affection and fear that it might be withheld, it will lead to hostility, even if we get the donation. We will fear the withholding of the gift or feel that the gift was not large enough and that will make us resentful of the power that the donor has over us. And then we'll become envious of the donor's resources and then entertain ourselves with the proliferation of theories concerning why the donor really doesn't deserve to have all those resources and why we should have them instead. And then the downward spiral into sinfulness really gains momentum. Fear spawns envy. Envy triggers greed, and greed breaks all the bonds of empathy. Any sense of community, any sense of being in a project together between the donor and the donee is shattered. The donor is the enemy that must be manipulated and controlled and exploited. Now, Henry's was a grim but possibly realistic view of human nature. Apart from God's grace, he thought down deep 
we all hate the donor. We hate the, the power that the donor has over us. And to make it a little more equitable, the donor hates us too. <laughs> but that depressing note is not, for Henry Nouwen, the absolute end of the story. Nouwen was a Christian. In fact, he was a priest. There is good news, and for him, shockingly good news. If we know that God has already met our needs, that we are already embraced by the maker of heaven and earth, and if we really feel that God's love in the recesses of our hearts, then we can ask for funds without any concern for our respectability, without any concern for maintaining our facade of strength then our sense of worth won't depend upon the potential donor's response. We won't fear being criticized, devalued, rebuffed, or rejected. Then we can cheerfully admit our weaknesses and our vulnerability. We can be what Nouwen called jolly beggars. And convinced of God's love, we can then ask for assistance not out of desperation, but out of joy. We will not be saying to ourselves, oh, I need to get this gift at all costs by any means necessary, or my world will collapse. Everyone will pity me and despise me if I don't get this money, and my life will have no value. Rather than that, our motive for request, the request of help, will be this. God loves me. And that's all I really need. And in fact, God loves all of us. And I want to share that good news. Not because my sense of self-worth depends on it, but simply because I'm overflowing with joy. And sharing that divine love in word and in deed will require some resources that I don't have right now. But I know that God's love is not contingent upon my securing those resources. I'm gonna ask for them so I can share the joy, and if I don't get them, I'll still be joyful. We can therefore request resources without fear of rejection, without compulsive anxiety, without secret envy, and without inner resentment. And then, according to Nouwen, something truly magical can happen. Fundraising and fun giving can give birth to a new community of intimacy and solidarity between the donor and the donee. Paradoxically, community is born when we realize that we don't desperately need the other person or that person's resources. We don't really need the benefactor. Rather than implicitly saying, give to me or else myself and my institutions will shrivel and die, we say, I invite you to share with me in this vision of the love of God enacted upon earth. We can be in this project together. I cheerfully admit that for this work, I do need your support. And according to now, and this can be a transformative moment for the donor. It's an invitation for them to serve the purposes of God in a way that is suited to their unique gifts. We're giving them an opportunity to participate in the work of God by putting the fruits of their labors at God's disposal. That's the beneficiary's gift to the benefactor. Both are joining in a new spiritual community of service a community that transcends the limits of time and space. Both the recipient and the giver are bound together in a new friendship, a new kind of sisterhood and brotherhood born of a shared task. They don't give out of guilt or duty or obligation or a desire for prestige. As Nowen remarks, when compared with the new freedom and new friends in a new community, the money is the least interesting thing in the transaction. 
you aren't so much asking the donor for money as you are inviting the donor into a new relationship, a new community, with a new vision and a new purpose. And that, to the donor, is a gift. But here's the rub. How do we cultivate such a strong sense of God's love that we can stand without anxiety with both the rich and the poor, knowing that our worth does not depend upon their attitudes towards us? How do we feel the love of God? For now, and the answer was embarrassingly simple. It's prayer. I think you've heard of that. Prayer enables us to be sensitive to God's unmerited grace. It enables us to unearth the deepest roots of our idolatry and face them squarely, surrounded by the love of God. And we become more conscious of God's compassion, then gratitude grows in our hearts. And the rise of gratitude overflows the boundaries of our self-concern and opens our eyes to, to the reality that everything that we have is from God and opens our hands to share our God-given gifts and to receive them from others. Now, and ends his curious little book on fundraising with a celebration of fundraising and fund, give, fund giving as a joyful, God-given exercise in mutuality and reciprocity. Trusting that God has already, already given us everything that we ultimately need, we can approach the ministry of fundraising without the paranoid fear that we might be rebuffed. We can ask for help without envy, suspicion, trepidation, or resentment. We can hope that through our efforts, a community of the mutual sharing of gifts and the service of God will be born. But we will not be disheartened or disillusioned if it is not. No matter what eventuates, we can rest confident in God's love with our vision fixed on God's coming reign. So that's the uh, gist of Nouwen's reflections on the spirituality of fundraising. He meant what he said. He thought that fundraising, done rightly, if it was done in the conviction that God loves us and, we, and our well-being and our worth does not depend upon the results of our activities to get money for our projects, that it can be a source of new community, new vision, and closeness to God. So fundraising can be a spiritual discipline for him and was just as much as prayer, fasting, or even helping the poor. So now I'm, I'm curious what you, we have some time, um, what you think about this. Is he Pollyanna-ish or maybe the opposite? His assessment of human beings is too grim and bleak or is he too optimistic about God's grace? Does it really work that way? Can people get so much in touch with God's love that they can be um, somewhat insouciant about what other people think of them? So was he too pessimistic? Was he too optimistic? Was he basically out to lunch? Should he have stayed in the Trappist monastery and been silent? Um, yeah. Is there any um, data on how much money he personally requested being asked for going and talking to donors and whether he got what he... He did do that, not for himself, but for projects that he um, believed in. Um, and I do not know if there's, I doubt there's any data as to how successful his efforts were. He did, I mean, one, one thing was obvious, he did have some uh, friends, and you need, might even call them disciples, who had significant financial resources. Uh, he also had some friends who were utterly destitute, and some who were almost um, absolutely autistic. So he embraced the entire range of humanity. 
Um, now, how much money he received from his wealthy friends, I don't know. Because I work in fund development, and I'm working very much behind the scenes. And the successful fundraisers, our development officers, have an outgoingness, can really articulate the needs of the organization, and they can make that connection. And I don't know, from, from what I've understood from Dr. Nowen, I mean, was he a good communicator, or was he more, you know, back here, more ethereal? Because I just, I can't, when I think of him as a fundraiser, I, I'm, I feel I'm still- No, he didn't, he, 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 he didn't have elevator speeches. <laughs> uh, nor did he have, nor, nor did he try to make a case for any organization. That's, that's not the way he operated. Um, he operated more by um, exuding a sort of confidence in God's grace and God's love. And that was contagious. And then people would give. So he didn't come up with a, a rationale for why is this institution or this program more valuable in the long run than this other program. Um, he just sort of like created a community of grace and love and then people gave. So, so that's all you have to do. <laughs> yeah. I think um, I mean, some of what you're saying about now and is resonating with an interview I watched with uh, Mother Teresa and William S. Buckley. It was done in like 1989. Um, and the similarity, the two things that I took from what she said, um, the conversation covered a lot of ground, but William S. Buckley was trying to get her to promote how to give to her, yeah. her uh, organization. <laughs> various places and she really resisted that and said you know I, I don't ask for money um, people see what we do and people send money and they find ways to do it she said because they want to be a part of it um, she ended up he ended up crying out of her a, a loose address and she said it, it will get there if you send it to that in Calcutta yeah but um, her the other point she made was that she didn't teach that people gave out of their abundance no matter what you had, you were called by Christ to share that. Wherever you were, whether you were poor or, or wealthy yeah. and everywhere in between, it wasn't a giving out of your abundance. You gave, you shared what you had. Yeah, um, now I would agree with that somewhat. Okay. But he wouldn't like giving out of guilt okay. or a sense of obligation. Yeah. He wouldn't like, well, there are poor people out there. They're miserable. You're a Christian. You're supposed to love your neighbors. Therefore, you should give. Um, rather, you should give, he thought, out of, a, out of an abundance of love. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it just, that if you really feel loved by God, it's just going to spill over. And I think she may have said that. I just yeah. took something yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. It almost seems like that approach will work primarily if you don't have any imperative investment in the organization. Yeah. But if you're but if you're invested in that organization, it's a it's a trickier relationship. Well, he uh, a, a couple of things. Um, if by investment you mean like in, in emotionally invested in the success of that institution or its longevity, he, he, he'd say, well, you're still anxious. <laughs> you know, you're, you're you're worried what will happen to your institution in the future. And you're worried about its possible decline and demise. So you're operating from a position of fear. And the fear is also very egocentric. It's, you know, I'm affiliated with this institution and I'm invested in this institution. And therefore, if it, if it goes down the tubes, that will reflect poorly upon me and I'll be regarded uh, by the world as a loser. As someone who backed a losing proposition and I will be ridiculed and despised. Uh, or at least I won't be regarded as a winner. And he'd say, well, you need to just get over that. Um, your institution might go down the tubes. Mm -hmm. And that's OK, because God still loves you. And your worth in the eyes of God does not depend upon the success 
of your institution or your fundraising activities. So surprisingly, according to now, you can only be a successful fundraiser and have a flourishing project or institution if you really don't care. Mm. Or let me put it this way. You don't care ultimately about the result. Because there's a part of you saying, no, yeah, this doesn't work. You know, if the congregation closes, God is still God. God still loves me. I'm good with that. And that, sh or that could make you so sort of serene and open to others yeah. that it would be contagious. So people gave to, to Henry not so much because they were convinced that the projects he was endorsing were going to be successful and fruitful, but more because his love for them was just contagious. And I think they just trusted him and figured, well, if he likes this, it must be a good thing. So he didn't even have meat. He, he almost, if you'd asked him, you know, what's so good about that institution, he wouldn't have known what to say. So he wasn't trying to argue people by proving the superiority of a particular project or, or, or um, institution. It was just, I love it, and I hope you love it too. And if you felt that he was someone who was serene and tranquil and had a profound sense of being loved by God, that was, that was indeed contagious. So all you have to do to be a successful fundraiser is to be absolutely serene and be in touch with the love of God at all times. <laughs> which is why he emphasized prayer, which was weird um, because that was his solution to everything. Pastoral care, uh, which I had a class from him and only passed because I promised never to offer pastoral care to anybody in my life. Um, there was nothing, there were no case studies. There was no field work. There was no reading of psychological texts. Um, there was no practical instruction over how not to trip over feeding tubes when you're in a, in a hospital. Um, his, his course on pastoral care was all about prayer. He just said, you know, if you, if you learn how to pray and be in touch with God's grace, you will know what to say in an emergency room. Mm -hmm. I evidently didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, sort of, but if, 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 if now and we're directing fundraising efforts here, and actually I'm not sure how our fundraising efforts uh, operate. I mean, he, he'd basically say, here's what not to do. Don't go up to people and say, Lancaster Theological Seminary is an excellent and valuable thing for the world to have for the following reasons. And it's much better uh, than, let's say, Moravian Seminary or Yale Divinity School um, it's it because of the following reasons and therefore you should give and if you don't give generously we're going to go under and all that excellence will be lost to humanity forever and ever and Christianity will implode and chaos will reign. Um, that's not the way to go. Uh, I'd say you know the way to go is say well you know we're all loved by God Christianity is going to be fine the world will be fine Humanity will survive, whether there's a Lancaster Theological Seminary or not. Um, whether the faculty get paid, God is still God. I, I want to I qualify that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we think that this is a good, a good thing, and we invite you to share in our mission. So the fundraising would not be driven by fear of extinction, like we really need the money or we're doomed. Um, it would be, we think we got a good thing going, um, would you like to give? With the footnote, even if you don't and the institution doesn't survive, that's still fine. Because God is still God and the 
health and well-being of the world does not depend upon Lancaster Theological Seminary. Or your congregation, when if by a miracle you get one. <laughs> um, or start one. <laughs> uh, so th that, that might sound a little bizarre, but he, it worked. Because when people felt his serenity, which was palpable, uh, and his, his inner peace and his confidence that he was loved by God, they generally trusted him and figured, well, if he thinks that's a good thing, I'm going to give to it too. Uh, this is the second year I've taken part in this student debt matching grant project. And I think maybe what you were referring to is not giving to Lancaster, but to, but to us, yeah. and separating yeah. that. And it has been, the participating in this has been a real spiritual practice for me because I've been able to gauge where I am on that continuum of trust and and, and fear-basedness. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, the letter that I put out to people was really an invitation to do something that was joyful. You know, participate yeah, exactly. in this. If you find this with me exactly. that brought joy to your life, yeah. I would really appreciate it. When I stand really firmly in that, I felt very comfortable. If I started to gauge myself and estimate, well, this person makes this much money and they should and conversely, something I found when people were really generous to me, I felt kind of like, oh, do I deserve getting that from somebody? So it's been a real practice for me. And I would agree with yeah. its basic premise of we're held in this yeah. big container of God's love no matter what. And all of the other constructs are things that we do. Right. Yeah, that's what you said is very now and ask. If you were saying to yourself, you know, and as individuals in the debt reduction program, if you're saying to yourself, as you write letters to potential donors, if you're saying to yourself, if, if I don't get the money, I'm going to starve. You know, I, I, I need these letters to bring in money or I'm going to be living in a cardboard box. Mm -hmm. um, you're doomed because your, your fear will be obvious. Um, donors will sense it. They're like dogs. <laughs> <laughs> they can smell fear. Um, and even if they give, they'll do it grudgingly, resentfully, and you'll receive it resentfully. Because you, you might well do, as you, I think you indicated, if, you're, if it's fear-based, uh, you might well try to get their income tax returns and calculate how much they could have given without doing irreparable economic damage to themselves and figure, well, they gave me $2,000. They could have done 10. Uh, and so the, so the resentment lingers, even if the request is fruitful. So for now, that's a, a good way to put it. It's, the main difference is, is the request made out of fear that if I don't get the money, I'm going to be embarrassed in the eyes of the world. People won't like me anymore. My life will be a mess. Um, I won't be able to pay my tuition. The faculty will not receive their salary. This, <laughs> I, I keep returning to that theme. <laughs> um, rather than, I feel loved by God. God's love is going to be triumphant, no matter how you slice it. Um, and out of that confidence, um, I would like to invite other people to share with me in this project. And if they don't, God is still God, I'm still loved, and it's okay. The Hidden Side through a little, uh, yeah, same theme, but in a little different way, is that instead of seeing this as uh, asking people for money, it's giving people the, or it's yeah. allowing people the opportunity to give, which is something that we all need to do if we're responding to the grace of God in our lives. Yeah, because you're, 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 and that, that was something he, he stressed. You're doing them a favor uh, because you're giving them the opportunity to do something meaningful with their resources. Um, so you're not just asking for yourself or even for your institution, you're doing it for their sake. And if they say, well, you know, I don't think I will find my life to be meaningful if I give to you. That's okay. Yeah. 
kind of what when you were talking about his mindset. I had this just a memory um, back in the 90s. I was working for a major urban ministry center in North Carolina. And it was started by 25 churches in downtown Raleigh by a nun. And um, everybody who worked there had such a love for the organization. It was faith-based, but it was not necessarily Christian. It was just we were going to serve everyone, you know, churches, um, synagogues, um, temples gave to us. Um, we had medical care, crisis intervention, food, pharmaceuticals, dental. It was amazing. And I was just thinking back on that time. We had that, just that connection that we knew if we asked, it would come because the organization was so phenomenal. And I haven't worked for an organization since that was that wonderful. And I, I know what that's like. I know what that's like. I mean, I didn't have this kind of sense that I had when God loves me and you know, the, place, the place was not going to, no one would, would ever let it go belly up. In fact, um, we probably increased our church support um, I think by the time I left, we had 220 churches in Wake County and the surrounding counties supporting us. In yep. addition to, and it just shows that if you do have that connection, that mindset, and that joy, it's like it does come. It, it really does. But then again, it's the 90s when yeah. people were flushed. Yeah, N now it would want the whole thing to be done out of joy, both the asking and the giving. But he would add a, um, a footnote it might not come, and that's okay. As an individual, let's say you're a student asking for funds, you might not get it. And that's okay, God still loves you. As an institution, your congregation might not get it. That's okay, God still loves them. Lancaster Theological Seminary might not get it. That's okay, God still loves humanity. So, so there's, the, there's gotta be that confidence that, uh, for now, that our well-being, the well-being of humanity, the well-being of the world, does not depend upon the success of our asks. Now, it might well be the case that if you can ask in that sense of joy and serenity, that you actually might be more likely to uh, receive what you ask for. And now I'm sort of thought, it is more likely. But that's not the motive or the goal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because um, he did want um, the asker to not feel like they were in a position of inferiority. Like, I don't have any resources. This person has resources. I, I need their resources. It was, that person does have financial resources, but I have other resources that they need. Um, and therefore, it's, it's a win-win, it should be a win-win situation. I'm giving a meaningful project to you to share in God's ministry, and you're giving some financial resources to me. Why did Lancaster Theological Seminary hire a consultant? And the contract says that this consultant will raise $20 million. Um, <laughs> that's a trick question. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to uh, channel Donald Trump. Uh, what did you say? <laughs> um, from, from Nowen's perspective, uh, to try to quantify it like that is a mistake. Because it's too much focused on the success of the ask. Now that's not to, one thing he did, he, of course he did not want people to not ask. He did not want to denigrate the importance of asking. It was just don't construct your sense of self-worth and value on the success of your request. And so, isn't it the case that people do that? I mean, as individuals? Say, those of you who have had to solicit funds for yourselves and it hasn't been successful, don't you have a feeling, well, I must be kind of a jerk. Um, people don't like me. 
They don't think what I'm doing is valuable. Um, I evidently don't have the gifts and qualities that they admire. And don't institutions feel that way? I, I over the summer I met, no, this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I met um, uh, a student who was about to graduate from the, what once had been Andover Newton Seminary, which of course had in a much reduced scale been absorbed by Yale Divinity School and its original campus and individual identity was no more. So basically, she was saying, you know, I'm, I'm graduating from a school where I will be the last class and my, I will have no real alma mater to return to. I cannot go back to alumni day at the campus that I once knew, where I once lived. Um, in a very truncated form, the school will continue in theory um, three hours away from here. Um, so I am thinking of myself as, oh, you were there, <laughs> uh, as, a, uh, as a loser. You know, I'm the graduate of a school that went belly up. And um, her pain was palpable. And that's sad. So she wasn't doing what Nowen would have recommended and just saying, ah, some of my school went belly up, who cares? God loves me. Well, even if you didn't get your degree, God, God loves you. I wonder about um, when I was in corporate America, the, the idea was always to win. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was never accept no for an answer. Mm. And so when you're out even asking for funds or something, you can have that type of mentality that you don't accept no for an answer. And you get a no, well, no, you don't give up. You absolutely don't, don't give it. It's all about winning. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the opposite. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's all about winning. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the strange thing is, because I've seen it happen, is that with, with now, and it would be successful, even though his attitude was, I don't really care. Because if you give to me, fine, wonderful. I love that. If you don't give to me, Fine, wonderful, God still loves me. So that gave him a sort of um, um, non-anxious attitude towards the whole transaction that was contagious. And I think did open people's hearts and made them more generous. Is that a detachment from success? Yeah. From, uh, uh, yeah, it's basically, I don't need the approval of society. Mm -hmm. And he lived that out, I mean, finally he, he said, um, I, don't, I don't need to teach at Harvard. I want to go live with autistic people. Uh, two questions. One, did he ever pastor his own church? Well, he was a priest. Um, I, don't think he, I don't think he ever was a parish priest. Okay. And I mean, he did perform pastoral duties. Right. You know, he said mass. He did weddings. He did mine, dressed as a rabbit, a reindeer, rather. <laughs> Yeah. Even if he got a no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because God's grace is um, persistent. So even if you get a no, that doesn't mean the no is forever. Well, I know it's about definition. You know, you were talking about winning. You know, what, what's the ultimate sense of winning or success? You know, if you define winning by the material world, it looks one way. If you define it by the spiritual world, it's a whole different experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's a, one way to put his attitude is spiritually, we've all already won because yeah. God loves us. Who could ask for anything more? So we've already won. So that means the asking is not done in desperation. Because you don't really, because you've got the one thing that really matters. So anything else is icing on the cake. It's dessert, it's not the meat and potatoes. And the meat and potatoes has sugar in it anyway, so you don't really need the dessert. It's like chicken and waffles. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you would like this term, but I think to me there's a power in giving up the power. There's a, there's a confidence there. And, and when we mentioned corporate America, I can, 
I flash back to some sales that when I was in a salesperson for, for a modeling company. Um, I hated being a salesperson because I had this image of what salespeople were, but I was pretty good at it actually. Um, uh, but I remember being taught this technique that was almost like a, a last ditch effort. And it, in a sense it gave, uh, for different motives, was the same thing. And it was just simply called the takeaway cards. Where if it, you know the customer was just really giving you a hard time and you just couldn't get there through any other normal discussion, I mean, I would begin to pack up my stuff and thank them for the time and say, you know, um, I, you know, we really, I'm going to make a decision on behalf of the company. We have other business we can focus on. I hope your project goes well. Fairly often in doing that, in packing up and getting ready to leave, they would stop me before I hit the door and say, we'll sign right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, there was, uh, granted, it, it was not done in the spirit of mine. I was using it. Yeah, 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 I need yeah, to get this commission. Yeah, I yeah, lie, yeah, I, yeah. But I yeah. also did feel like you worked for a good company. It just, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> there, there's I, a I slight there. parallel yeah, there. It was, <laughs> a lot, but, uh, it, was uh, it was better than not doing it. Yeah. You know, to say, okay, I, I, I appreciate your time. Um, we'll go somewhere else. <laughs> Why do you think uh, you knew him well, uh, uh, more, <laughs> more well than any of us in this room? Uh, oh, just because he lived two doors down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would have known him just as well if you'd lived two doors down. I'm sure I would have, but I, had, I never had the privilege of even meeting him. And I, I have, I think I have every book he wrote, and he became, after graduating from the seminary, kind of my view. Mm -hmm. Pastoral people. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think uh, the lasting impact? I mean, the, why is it so many generations now have been drawn to his writings? Uh, and before him to Thomas Merton, because in a way he sort of continues a trajectory started by Merton. Um, it's a good question. Why Protestants would? Um, because his his form of spirituality is actually the most rigorous kind known to Christianity. I mean, it's tough. Because um, it, it, it involves, in a way, putting your own ego to death, um, getting rid of your ego needs. And that was very consistent with him. Of course, what made it more palatable was that you can't do that yourself. It's only possible with God's grace and his conviction, which was more common with Catholics than with Protestants, is that we already do feel God's grace within. Everybody does. Um, so you don't need to have an altar call or a conversion experience. All you need to do is look within and you'll find the love of God. And that, that sense of God's grace is universal, spread all over the place. Um, I know this is being recorded, but I'll say it anyway. One of his favorite technical theologians on the Catholic side was Bernard Lonergan, um, who was in Catholic circles sort of regarded as the theologian of grace. And, when, um, and Lonergan's writings were very impenetrable and very technical. Um, and so when he was dying, um, one of his students asked him, you know, Father Lonergan, uh, what exactly is it that you've been trying to say all these years? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can you be succinct now that you're checking out? And he said, uh, yes, I can. It, what I've been trying to say is very simple. The grace of God is blowing through the universe. It's going up your nose and out your butt. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of um, Nowen's view. God's love, God's grace is in all of us. All you have to do is pause, be silent, pray, and you'll find it. And then nothing else will really matter. Because you will have the pearl of great price, the one thing needful. Oh, my Baptist roots are coming out and I'm <laughs> spouting biblical phrases <laughs> out of context. Um, <laughs> Any other questions and, or remarks? I'm curious, how many find this somewhat attractive and plausible? And plausible or 
Yeah, yeah. Pl plausible. How many find this to be hopelessly Pollyanna-ish? And what we really need are, uh, let's say, um, advice from social scientists on how to get people to say yes. I, I, I once, one summer when I was in graduate school, I had the unfortunate um, experience of trying to raise money to support myself by selling tickets to the local theater. And there was an obligatory seminar we had to go to first on salesmanship. And what we were told, and this was told, um, number one, get people into the habit of saying yes. So don't ask them right off, do you want to buy a season subscription to Long Wharf Theater? Say, do you like entertainment? Because nobody's going to say no. <coughs> and then make it a little narrower. Do you like live theater? And just get them in the habit of saying yes. And as they get into the habit of saying yes, they're more likely to say yes when you finally say, would you like a season subscription? We've established that you really like this stuff, and so you need a season subscription. But then he also said, um, do some research on neighborhoods and target the neighborhoods of the oldest persons because they're more likely to be intimidated and they're more malleable. So I was thinking to myself, so my instructions are uh, be a vulture preying on the elderly and trick them into saying yes. And that's the way sales works. So that's the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. the, the message that I, I, it's what I want to underline for the students especially is that if, if there's, if there's, you know, if there's any sense that uh, our ego depends upon the outcome, yeah. uh, we're probably uh, doomed in, in the uh, task. Yeah. Uh, oh, and he expanded that to not just this task, but human life in general, right. but ministry in particular. Right. Said if you're expecting that your self-understanding and your sense of self-worth is gonna come from your congregation because they're gonna love you and appreciate you and give you kudos every time you preach, don't go into ministry. And said, and if you do, you're dangerous. You're dangerous to yourself because you'll burn out very quickly, you'll become disillusioned, you'll become bitter, and you will hurt them. So, have a nice day.